We work with a lot of software companies uh, here in the New York City area. Also am the uh, cloud editor of the Ignition Showcase blog, which is a blog that we publish with information mainly of interest to software companies. What we're going to do today is we're going to take a journey with a friend of ours. It's an architect. And this is our architect friend. It's Jim. Jim is an architect, and he's had, heard a lot about cloud computing. Uh, but he has a lot of questions. And the more he reads, the more confused he gets. Uh, you heard Steve earlier mention how uh, everybody is rushing to cloudify existing products that they have. Uh, it all seems like almost everything is cloud related these days. What we're going to do is try to clear up some of that. So our objectives today, we're going to talk about a clear architectural definition of cloud computing. Because there are people who objectively have looked at cloud computing and tried to come up with a model for that. We're also going to share a few design patterns that you can look at when you're thinking about moving existing applications into the cloud. And since I work for Microsoft, we'll illustrate some of those patterns with uh, the, Azure plat the Windows Azure platform and some solutions. But bear in mind that these solutions are appropriate and these patterns are appropriate to other platforms as well. Oops, wrong button. <laughs> OK. When it comes to defining cloud computing, the National Institute of Standards has done a pretty good job of coming up with a model for cloud computing. Uh, they kind of define it this way, and then we'll drill down into what their model consists of. Uh, they talk about enabling a convenient, on-demand network access to a shared pool of configurable resources, uh, and that that can be rapidly provisioned and released on an, uh, on a service prov on an on-demand basis without getting the service provider involved. Okay, so their model is, consists of five essential characteristics, three service models, and four deployment models. These are the five characteristics, and it makes pretty much pretty good sense. On-demand self-service, uh, broad network access, resource pooling, elasticity, the ability to scale up and scale down, and measurement, the ability to measure the service. The three service models, which you've probably heard a lot about by now, are infrastructure as a service, software as a service, and platform as a service. Let's take a look at, the, uh, at that particular model. If you look at this stack on the left, that's a traditional IT stack involving hardware and software. The, uh, you have networking and storage and servers. And nowadays, you have some sort of virtualization involved. And then above that, you have operating system layer, middleware, database, so forth. The whole objective, though, of this whole stack is to provide a place to run applications and store data. The infrastructure as a service vendors, such as Amazon, provide the lower levels of the stack. So they basically provide the plumbing that would let you run your own operating system uh, run your applications and data. The platform as a service vendors, like Microsoft and Google and Force, provide much more of that stack. Okay? So they provide everything up to the level where you basically just solve your business problem. In other words, you bring your data, you bring your applications to the platform. Of course, the real objective, especially for the folks that I work with in terms of software vendors, is the software as a service stack where they provide the entire stack from top to bottom, including the application. Okay, the four deployment models are kind of interesting. Four deployment models are public cloud, private cloud, community cloud, and hybrid cloud. And here's a quick picture of that. Public cloud, you're all familiar with by now, that's what Microsoft and Amazon and Google and Salesforce provide. Uh, private cloud is the ability to turn your own data center into a cloud to use the same techniques that the cloud vendors have discovered and invented to manage their clouds, but to operate your own data center the same way. Okay? Of course, community cloud, we find that in government situations where the government, you know, where uh, a smaller community wants to have a cloud that's limited to just their use. And hybrid cloud is really where we think most of the industry is going in the short term and, and medium term. Hybrid cloud is the ability to have private clouds and public clouds and have them work together. 
to build applications that span the data center to the cloud. Because we think that there are very few companies today that are actually moving en masse to the cloud, but there are a lot of companies that are dipping their toe in the cloud, that are building applications that leverage the cloud. Okay, pub a public cloud, as I said earlier, you're familiar with what a public cloud is. It's a pool of computing resources that's offered by a vendor, and it's normally offered on a pay-as-you-go basis. So the good news is it's an operating expenditure model, and you pay for what you use. That's also the bad news. So you have to be careful with public clouds that you use it appropriately and that you don't get incur, incur costs that you really shouldn't incur. This is a simple example of a simple schematic of Windows Azure. In Windows Azure, what you do is you build essentially an ASP.NET web application and you deploy it to the cloud. So you write your application, your data, you bring your data to the platform. We have thousands of servers running in lots of data centers around the world. And all of those data centers are managed by a big brain called a fabric controller. So we treat, kind of treat all those servers in a data center almost as if it was a single operating system, okay? So you bring your application to Windows Azure. You say how many copies of the application you want running. We wire up all the load balancers and so forth and all the networking and all the DNS mapping to support that. When the time comes to scale up or scale down, you just change essentially a simple field in a configuration file. And through an API or through a portal that we have, you can actually change that. And we will scale up or scale down in minutes. So a private cloud is essentially a public cloud that's running in your own data center, okay? It's a pool of computing resources. It lives in a self-managed data center. It's normally measured, although less so than public cloud, because in corporations, they're probably not as concerned about chargeback as we are in the public cloud. And uh, it is very strongly self-provisioned. And the interesting thing about private cloud, especially in the Microsoft world, is you've probably had the ability to turn your data center into a private cloud for a long time. Because when we built Hyper-V Cloud, which is our current cloud offering, that's uh, private cloud. It's based upon a lot of the same tools and technologies that people have been using for years, okay? So uh, I'm, again, this is a busy diagram. You'll have access to these slides after the presentation. But I just wanted to give you a, a feel for the fact that private cloud is really nothing more than the next step in evolution of your data center, okay? Community cloud, again, would be one that's shared by several organizations with similar requirements if they happen to have special requirements. Hybrid cloud, as I said earlier, is where we think the bulk of the interest is going to be because what that does is that leverages the best of all the models. For instance, you can build an application that is partly on your premise and partly on the premise of, let's say, your business partners or other companies. All right, and again, this is also a busy diagram. They only gave me 30 minutes, so I don't want to spend too much time going over it, okay? And although I'm talking mainly about platform as a service and Windows Azure here, I don't want to leave you with the impression that Microsoft is only in that particular space. We have a lot of other software as a service offerings that we also offer, things like Office 365, which I'll let you guys explore you know, on, on your own. Uh, but I did want to give you a kind of a quick view of the fact that nobody other than Microsoft has the breadth of cloud offerings available in the marketplace today. I can make that an unequivocal statement, okay? Also, when it comes to development, we think we've got the best development platform. Uh, and that holds if you're a traditional .NET developer, developer or if you're a Java developer developing on a platform like Eclipse. Again, if you're a .NET developer, you're gonna find you're using the same tools and technologies that you use to build on-premise applications to build cloud applications. Okay, that's a little overview of what we, again, what we think of the cloud in terms of the model. 
what we're going to do is talk about some design patterns. What we're going to do is focus upon what our friend Jim might be doing on premise today and what he could do to leverage the cloud. And the first pattern we're going to talk about is using the cloud for scale. So Jim's wondering if you know, the cloud is good for applications that scale dynamically. How does that work? So let's do some whiteboarding. Again, I don't have a whiteboard up here, but we've got some kind of whiteboardy slides. So we'll, we'll, you know, we'll do it this way. Uh, here's, an, here's a typical three-tier application. Earlier today, you saw the, the, the stages of evolution of cloud compu of, the, you know, of, of computing, client server, you know, mainframe client server, and so forth. Uh, after client server, of course, came multi-tier, which is uh, another, I, I consider that another, another step in the evolution. So Jim might build an application based upon a web browser, based upon people accessing a web server with web browsers, and possibly some kind of a web tier. Could be a single server, could be a web farm, right? Uh, also, uh, behind that might be a business layer tier. Again, servers serving up business objects and handling business logic, and in the back end, some kind of database. So let's say that is really successful. And if it's successful, what happens? Well, too many people access it, it becomes a bottleneck, you have to scale up somehow, right? So using this cloud for scale can solve that problem. What would Jim do on premise normally? What Jim would do is he would add a farm where he had a single web server, and he would do some kind of load balancing, some kind of network load balancing. And in the cloud, we can provide that capability automatically. Just by changing the number of instances that, of an application that you're running, we can scale up, wire up load balancers, and so forth, so that we can handle the scale. Same thing, of course, could happen in the back end. Uh, you notice this uh, kind of funny terminology here? We're talking about the front end web servers, and we use the term web role. And in the back end, we use the term worker role. A web role is nothing more than an ASP.NET application. A worker role, think of a worker role kind of like a uh, Windows service or a daemon, all right? So web roles are good for talking to the outside world. Worker roles are great for doing back end number crunching. Typical example might be if you have an idea to build the next YouTube. So you have web roles that communicate with the outside world and bring in people, upload videos, and possibly worker roles in the back end to do the, uh, the encoding and encryption. Okay. This is, I didn't want to go into too much detail given the time, but this is just an example of the configuration file that is uploaded with your application. And as you can see, there, there's an instance count in there. And the instance count basically says we want three instances of this particular web role running. Or if I change that to four, within minutes I'll have another one running. And if I scale it down, the same, it'll scale down appropriately. So that's the first pattern. The second one is using the cloud for compute. And again, Jim has heard that since this, since this uh, platform does provide all this scalability and lets you scale up and scale down on request, how can I use lots and lots of different instances of a program to solve a computing problem? And can I do it in parallel? Let's say I've got a huge file that needs analyzing. And how many people here have heard the term MapReduce? OK. MapReduce is a technology and a framework for actually doing parallel processing. And the cloud lends itself really well to that. So a typical architecture, uh, in fact, I had a chance to uh, build, uh, build a system like this for a major pharmaceutical company last year where they wanted to do molecular analysis and they wanted to analyze thousands of, of molecules in parallel. Uh, they cut their processing time from weeks to hours through this. But the whole idea is to divide and conquer, right? to split up the work, pass it off to a huge number, to a bunch of worker roles. In their case, they were running 200 of them. And then collect the results back to a centralized collector and report the results. So MapReduce is something we don't, you know, the, we've built applications based on that pattern. Uh, we don't have a product yet. We're working on various things that uh, we might be announcing in the future, okay? 
Okay, let's switch gears and talk, that was compute. Let's switch gears and talk about storage. How, how many people here believe the cloud supports infinite storage? Well, I guess infinity is, 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 is a matter of opinion, right? Uh, but any time that I can get enough storage for any request that I make, and I can scale up and scale down within minutes, to me, that, that's kind of infinite. And uh, we're building huge data centers. The other platform providers are you know, building huge data centers so that there will always be storage available. Because Jim's got lots of headaches managing his data. It sounds too good to be true, this infinite storage. So how would Jim handle storage today? Well, there's two kinds of storage out there. There's uh, normal storage and there's relational database storage. So Jim would set up a file server to handle his file, file storage, or he would use a, a, you know, a, a SQL server, Oracle server, what have you, for relational database. So how would the cloud help? The big advantage of the cloud is that it breaks the affinity between data and hardware. In other words, you're not tied to scaling, you're not tied to buying a number of servers to support your data requirements or a number of disks to support your data requirements. Again, it's an operating expense model, okay? And in Windows Azure, and again, we can't drill down too far, but Windows Azure proper, the operating system, and again, I call it the operating system. Remember, we're talking about that fabric of servers in a data center that's thousands and thousands of servers wide, controlled by the fabric controller. Uh, that complex, in a way, is like an operating system, right? And it supports storage in the form of blobs, tables, and relational data. Blob storage is binary large objects. It's really basically videos, large text documents, huge stuff, okay? Tables are essentially named value pairs of properties where if you really have to store and access a tremendous amount of data, like let's say you're trying to index the internet, you might use table storage because the advantage of table storage is that you can spread that data across hundreds or even thousands of servers. And of course, relational data, we think relational data, we at Microsoft think of SQL Server, and basically we support a variant of SQL Server in the cloud. So again, this is a, an example of, uh, you know, of blob storage. And everything, by the way, in, uh, in Windows Azure storage is accessed through a re representational state transfer interface, or REST interface, which means any platform can access it. Blobs, tables, and so forth. It's all accessible from whatever platform you, have to, you want to use. And by the way, I didn't mention, but I guess I should mention that every piece of data in Windows Azure is stored in triplicate. So it's automatically fault tolerant. So if it's a piece of blob storage, there are really three copies. You only pay for one, but there's three. If it's relational data, there are three copies of a relational database out there. You only pay for one. Be and the reason for that is if something should go wrong, and in the cloud, you have to make the assumption that things will go wrong. We want to be able to recreate a bad, you know, a corrupt database from the other two copies, or a bad blob from the other two copies. So that's what I mean when I say, you know, we're, we're fault tolerant. Okay. Again, tables, uh, tables are as I described. <coughs> excuse me, as I described them earlier. Uh, you know, essentially tabular form of name value pairs, properties, uh, and again, we have the same REST interface, plus if any of you are familiar with language integrated query, link, we also provide a link interface to, those, to that information. Of course, relational, there's not too much to say about relational database, because essentially, it is SQL Server in the cloud. So if you're familiar with SQL Server or one of the other relational database management systems, you can see that, you know, how, how that might work. And again, you can talk on, from, client, from client systems in the world into the cloud to an instance of SQL Azure, or, or you can actually have an application running in the cloud that acts as a front end to the SQL Azure database. So there's lots of different architectures that you can build. And again, this is kind of an example showing that, that we've got browsers coming into a web role. A web role is actually accessing the, the database. Although we support REST interfaces for everything, 
We also support TDS, and for those of you who've dealt with, uh, you know, with SQL Server, you know that TDS is the protocol that every single existing tool and application uses to access SQL Server. So in many cases, what you can do is you can have an application running on premise and just change the connection string to be talking to the, the SQL Server database in the sky as opposed to the on-premise instance of SQL Server. Okay, let's talk about some more patterns. And again, I, I tried to, I had to pick four. The, I think the original, the original announcement for the, the presentation said five, but that was before I found out I only had a half an hour. So let's, we, we picked four. Jim has heard, and Jim's company has to communicate across trust boundaries with other organizations. It's always been tricky to do that. And he wants to know if the cloud will do anything to help him do that. So how would Jim have handled this before? Okay, prior to the internet, he would have used, he would have had to use the network provided by the telephone company. Now, with the advent of the internet, of course, he could use the internet. But there are still some major issues communicating uh, between companies and across cloud boundary, across uh, organizational boundaries. The number one problem is firewalls. Companies don't want a lot of foreign traffic going through their firewall to their internal network. The other thing is a little technique that we use to maximize our use of the, uh, I, the uh, IP address space called network address translation. So firewalls and network address translation get in the way of building applications that span company boundaries. So how does the cloud help? Well, we've probably all used at one time or another a messaging service like GoToMyPC, uh, to use an example, where both endpoints of a conversation will make an outbound connection to some kind of relay station, and that relay station will tie those two connections together so that traffic can flow in both directions. We have something that, that provides that capability for developers, and it's called the uh, Windows Azure App Fabric Platform Service Bus. It won't fit on a business card if you're in that group, okay, but it's a long title. Okay? So it works pretty much the same way. Both endpoints make an upbound connection. And again, you notice that the, uh, the protocol used and the, uh, the way of addressing things is, again, REST-based. So both endpoints make an upward connection to the service bus, and then data can travel in both directions. We recently announced a community technical preview about a, two weeks ago that has added pub-sub capabilities to service bus. So it's now possible to build applications where you have multiple subscribers and multiple providers of information, and they don't all have to be online at the same time. So when the service bus was first announced, I said we should call it the internet service bus. Uh, to distinguish it from things like the enterprise service bus. And now it's really becoming the internet service bus, a way of messaging between applications, whether they're online or not. So we think it's a, a pretty cool capability. We also have, uh, I hesitate to call it a VPN capability, but essentially we have the ability now to take these web and worker roles and add them to your internal corporate network so that they can be managed through your existing Active Directory or other security system. So if you're interested at all in building a network that has on-premise, uh, in the cloud, and also potentially out, you know, off, out of your office capability, check out the, uh, the Windows, Azure Connects, Windows Azure Connect. Okay? So uh, obviously, Jim is not real. You probably guessed that, right? Jim is kind of a composite of a lot of architects and CTOs that we've talked to, but the, the, you know, the concerns and problems and issues we think are real, okay? So what I hope you take away from this is again the National Institutes of Standards definition of cloud computing, that uh, somebody out there is really trying to do an objective job of defining what it is. Uh, we've talked about some usage patterns which, although they're illustrated uh, by, by Windows Azure, can work for a lot of different platforms. And with that, I, I want to thank you all for coming today to listen to me. And we'll open up, to, I have some time for Q&A, I think, about five minutes. So does anybody have any questions on anything that I've talked about? <laughs>